Okay. Well, it's 3.02. We've got 42 people in this virtual room. I imagine a few more will come in, though let's slowly get going because I know everybody has a lot to say in this session. So welcome everybody from around the world to the Council for European Studies Insights webinar series. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to uh, introduce this session to everyone. We're going to be talking about seeding Europe's future rural responses to global challenges. This is uh, one of several webinars that we've been hosting since last spring uh, on behalf of the Council for European Studies to give everyone around the world a taste of the kinds of research that we do within our various research networks, as well as individual scholars within the organization. Uh, we're delighted that everybody is able to join us. My name is Julia Moses. I'm here uh, introducing everybody on behalf of the executive committee of the CES. And we've got a really fantastic panel of people here from around the world to talk about this topic today. And our very able chair, Evie Borlides, will take over from here and introduce the speakers. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, yes, welcome everyone to the session today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Evie Verlides, um, and I will be chairing the uh, event today. I am a PhD candidate in sociocultural anthropology at the George Washington University. Um, I'm currently writing my dissertation, um, which focuses on uh, regenerative design and agricultural projects throughout Greece. Um, and the shared idea driving these projects is that you know, like um, soil can be regenerated, um, practices like ecological building, natural farming, and energy harnessing um, can also regenerate um, social and exchange relationships more broadly, those that have been um, harmed by economic and environmental crises. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today. Um, we have a fantastic uh, moderator and lineup of panelists who I will go ahead and introduce. Um, we have Elizabeth B. Jones, who is a historian of rural Germany and Europe. Um, she serves on the Research Editorial Committee at Europe Now, a publication of the Council for P uh, European Studies, um, and she will be moderating our discussion today. Um, Dr. Jones has recently retired from Colorado State University to focus on volunteer work dedicated to easing hunger and food supply problems in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Um, this recent work is related to her historical research that addressed rural poverty, labor relations, the environment, and 19th century state initiatives to establish new farming communities on marginal lands on Germany's Northwest or internal colonization. Um, now we're very lucky to have um, with us today also Hans Lorenzen, who is co-founder and president of the European Agricultural and Rural Convention, ARC 2020. Um, from 1985 to 2019, he was senior advisor to the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development of the European Parliament. He has an MA uh, degree in development sociology, a postgraduate degree in international agriculture from TU Berlin, and with special professional competence in international negotiations and mediation. He has carried out research coordination and evaluation work on rural development projects with the technical, technical service of the German government. On the international level, Hans Lorenzen is co-founder of Genetic Resources Action International and co-president of the European Rural Development Network Forum Synergies. He's also co-founder of PREPARE, the Partnership for Rural Europe, Network for Central and Eastern European Member States, serving as chairman and president until 2016. Um, he is also a board member of IATP Minneapolis, USA, and closer to home, he says he shares a local rural development organization on his home island of Pellworm in North Friesland, Germany, which works on organic farming, renewable energy production, organic seed production, soft tourism, and nature protection projects in a local dimension. Also with us today, we're very fortunate to have Tom Burston, Deputy D Director of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. He helps to lead this organization in its mission to bring people together to find radical and practical ways to transform our food system and improve our climate, nature, health and economy. Tom's work is driven by his understanding of how real development and sustainable change happens to inform planning and building trusting relationships. Tom brings experience of working with development agencies around the world, embracing different perspectives in order to find shared interests and common cause. When he's not working, you'll find Tom in Northumbrian Hills with his wife and their two children. He's a huge fan of Northumberland and is vice chair of Alwinton Borders Shepherd's Show, the North of England's premier hill farming show. We're also very fortunate to have Madeline McKeever with us. She grew up on a farm in Colmeath in Ireland. 
Um, she studied botany in Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, completing an MSc in, uh, an MSc in vegetation history in 1984. After some time traveling, including a year apprenticing on an organic farm in Maine, she began farming in West Cork in 1986. The farm in Ardegg was managed as an organic dairy farm from 1987 to 99, after which beef cattle and seeds became her main foci. She was a member of the Skiberian Food and Farming Group, growing awareness that ran conferences on genetic engineering in 1999 and the globalization of agriculture in 2000. The group started the, Sky the Skiberian Farmers Market in 2001, where she first began selling seeds. In 2005, the brown envelope seeds was registered as a business and half of the farm was planted in broadleaf trees. Since then, seed production has been the main source of income on the farm. Um, now, panelists have been requested to speak for um, 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, they will present in the order in which I introduce them um, to reflect on the following questions. Does rural Europe offer valuable templates for building more resilient, prosperous, and more sustainable societies? What have we learned in recent decades about food systems? And how have the COVID pandemic and accelerating climate change underscored the need to abandon business as usual? Um, so I will invite panelists um, to respond um, and I'll ask attendees um, to direct any questions they might have to the question and answer section of um, this Zoom webinar. So I will um, silence my mic now and Hans, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, what I will try to do during my time is to move a little bit through that um, CV, long CV, which you've presented. <laughs> I didn't mean to give you that long one, now, but okay, that was a background. I will move from the level of my professional career, which is European agriculture and rural policy. Um, what is the framework? in Europe for uh, rural areas, rural territory, rural communities to get into a resilient mood of production and living. Uh, I will then move to the question of um, how have food movements and the relation to food, um, how have they developed in Europe and what chances are there, which was uh, your uh, last question uh, how can we move out of business as usual? Uh, the CAP is a, a long history, also rural uh, policies have a long history in, in Europe, but what have people been doing uh, from the bottom up? What have, what, how has governance uh, developed in that time? And what is the current situation after COVID? We are still fully into the COVID crisis uh, it just reveals a lot of problems we have, especially also in rural areas. But what are the chances and the possibilities? Um, so those are the three steps. I start with my career in the European institutions. I've worked for 35 years in the European institutions, mainly on the issues of agriculture, rural development, environment and food. So what have I seen in that time? 35 years. When I started my career, and uh, nobody would um, um, uh, take it seriously uh, that organic farming is a possibility for farmers uh, to make a living and to, um, to keep uh, the communities alive. Uh, in the Committee on Agriculture, when organic farming, for instance, was mentioned as a more sustainable product production method, it was the best job. People would really laugh and think uh, somebody presented that would go back uh, onto the trees. Uh, this has completely changed in these 35 years. If you now talk about resilient um, uh, farming, uh, 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 about organic farming, uh, nobody would dare to say, well, that's not possible. Uh, on the contrary, it has become big business. And um, that is a big change. Now, through that period, when I was responsible or advisor at the Committee on Agriculture, the common agriculture policy has strongly changed. It was after the Second World War, it was created uh, with a perspective of, um, of course, um, avoiding another hunger crisis like after the war but it was also um, a um, tool 
to uh, free people from the rural areas and bring them into industrialization and industrial farm, industrial uh, production, but also in, uh, industrial farming. Uh, and the, uh, the main goal was, of course, to raise productivity, produce more uh, uh, through uh, um, very intensive farming. In the 80s and 90s, it became clear that the side effects were very negative, not only in terms of environment, but also in terms of losing uh, a lot of vitality in the rural areas. So in the 90s, the second pillar of the common agriculture policy, uh, rural policy, um, was invented. And uh, there was a declaration, Cork one at that time in Ireland, that was declaring that we need um, uh, um, to invest more into rural infrastructure, rural education, uh, uh, and uh, rural economy, uh, and diversify production, not to have just industrial farming, but to, to look into rural policy as such. And with that, an instrument, a very successful instrument was invented, and that was the so-called leader approach. Leader approach meant the bottom up, mobilizing on the local level communities to build partnerships between farmers, entrepreneurs, um, um, NGOs, and so on. Uh, to create a new tissue in rural areas to avoid depopulation. Um, and that was successful because with relatively little money, uh, the capacity, the social capital in rural areas was mobilized. And until today, since 1992, LIDA is the, the flagship of rural development and nobody would dare today to say that was not useful. The question is, where are we going while the first pillar of the common agriculture policy is still subsidizing farmers on the basis of their hectares uh, and is still giving money uh, to those 80 percent of the money that comes from public sources of the eu goes to 20 percent of the farmers so it is pushing into growth, it's pushing into big farm scale and it's pushing into industrial uh, production methods which have collateral, enormous collateral uh, effects on water biodiversity and so on. So as we are right now into the fourth uh, reform of the common agriculture policy, which I have seen, um, the question is indeed, um, are we continuing with business as usual, or do we really take up um, all the um, challenges which are pretty clear on the wall, written on the wall? It's climate change, it's biodiversity loss, I don't have to mention it all. It's all present, and the Green Deal that the European Commission was last year presenting as the way out was not at all matched into the process of the common agriculture policy. It was kind of a separate Mooney kind of thing, uh, which didn't uh, find its way into new legislation. Same thing with the biodiversity strategy, which the European Commission had launched as an intention, or the farm to fork program, which was also a proposal uh, to get closer links between farmers and uh, consumers. And here I am in my second part of my presentation. Food movements. The food movements came from the bottom up, as was uh, the, the approach of the rural development initiatives. You have certainly heard of slow food. They are also very uh, successful in, in the US and other parts. The principle of slow food is not only to be slower in food production, but to slow down and look at the qualities of food, nutrition, the question of the culture of um, eating, the question of relations between farmers and consumers. And um, uh, Carlo Petrini, who was the founder of Slow Food, uh, um, um, has invented a very nice slogan that consumers are co-producers because what they choose creates a certain production. And that means the relation is not just a demanding relation of a consumer, make it good, tasteful and cheap, but you get into a relation with the farmer by saying I'm co-responsible being a co-producer. Uh, 
And that is the basis, I think, of most of the food movements, be it farmers, um, uh, cooperatives, be it um, 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 uh, solidarity farming, CSAs, you have it in uh, all over the world. And the basis is we not only we go back to the local because it's so beautiful, but we need better relations, fair relations, understanding of what is needed and all the challenges which I mentioned earlier, climate change, biodiversity loss and so on, is a package. It's not separable. And that means if we talk about a price or if we talk about a certain product, we have to see the full picture. What does it mean? So if, if um, I buy um, uh, potatoes imported from the Sahara in uh, irrigated with uh, pumped up water, but without chemicals, is that an organic product? No. Uh, and, 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 we, and we need that kind of discussion and it is happening. Um, and the food movements, I would say, is bringing agriculture rural social ecology and resilience together and and giving answers as a as a as a whole and not as separate packages and so we can avoid that we separate each other in different corners of the problem you know uh, is is the is the um, uh, the organic the demeter approach the right one or uh, should we use um, at all digital means or whatever. No, it is the full picture. It, it has to respond at the same time to many things. And we have to look whether it fits. Does it fit for the purpose of reacting to all the challenges we are just now facing? So the food movement is on. The demand for a food policy instead of an agriculture policy or a consumer policy or whatever is already a demand for integration. And here, the institutions are completely incapable, apparently. And here's my third part, to do, to reflect this, to reflect that demand. And when I, when I now move to the question, how do we get out of COVID? I think that's not the key thing. COVID is just um, uh, revealing existing extreme problems, not only of poverty uh, in rural areas, not only of uh, limited excess, un unfair, complete unfair of distribution of public money. Uh, um, uh, COVID is, um, um, what do you call it? COVID is, is, is a way of, of uh, is, is a means of, of revealing, as I said, you know, wh where the problems lie. And um, I will close with uh, uh, something I really very much recommend you. When you look at the ARC 2020 website, uh, we have made analysis of a currently uh, running process um, on uh, Vision for Rural Europe 2040, which was launched a year ago by the European Commission uh, with the um, uh, objective to prepare, to prepare well for 2040. Our reaction to that has been, a vision is a wonderful thing. Um, a, a former chancellor, um, Mr. Schmidt, uh, said once, watch it, if you have a vision, you go, should go and see a doctor, right? Um, uh, well, a vision, in, in my view, is, is, is a good thing to, to um, have an idea of where we want to go, but 2040, uh, it needs a strategy from today to see how we can integrate the policies in order to really react to all the challenges I mentioned before. And this is why in our parallel process of ARC 2020, we've always pointed at um, the need to um, um, uh, work. When you work on a vision, you also have to work on a strategy how to get there. And then you have to start with action immediately because the need, if we look at 2030 only uh, from climate perspectives, uh, uh, Paris uh, agreement and so on, we are far away of, of being prepared for that date. So um, uh, um, we, have, we have spelled out the, the different steps that are needed 
to mobilize people for that, to change governance, to completely change the framework in which agriculture and rural areas will develop. Um, and and to, for, for instance, to spell out uh, the, the, the um, um, investments that are needed to um, allow farmers and allow rural communities to make that change towards a, a resilient uh, future. Um, uh, and I just give you one example because you mentioned uh, seed production. Um, uh, you know that uh, in farming, uh, seeds have taken away from farmers. Farmers are buying seeds and have to rebuy seeds all the time. They have no um, experience or capacity to really work with their seeds in order to adapt their farming to the challenges of climate change. On my home island, we have started with young farmers to work on our own farmers' seeds uh, to adapt them to the climate conditions. We have extreme weather uh, already um, in Northern Germany and we, uh, and we try to develop our own experience with it. That needs infrastructure, that needs capacities of um, uh, stocking, uh, 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 drying, uh, cleaning and so on, which have been concentrated. And if you don't centralize that infrastructure, be it also for leguminous crops, uh, whatever you need for uh, changing practices in agriculture, um, or um, um, I mean using digital in a way that is useful and not just leaving the data, the big data to the big guys, uh, uh, all that uh, needs a very, very um, uh, radical change in policies and subsidies and and in, 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 in reshaping infrastructure. So my conclusion is, unfortunately, what I see in, in Europe, but also in the United States, um, institutions are still on business as usual. And um, there's little right and left uh, of ideas of one, what, there are big concepts like the Green Deal or Farm to Fork, but in practice, what we see at least planned for the next seven years is reducing subsidies, public money for uh, rural development, clearly weakening the second pillar of the cap in Europe, um, strongly supporting the very old um, um, uh, uh, policy towards uh, making farms more competitive on the world market with huge collateral, collateral uh, uh, costs um, and demobilizing people. Even if in Europe now member states are more responsible for doing strategic plans, they have no targets, they have no criteria, they have no control mechanisms that really something is going to happen. And that means we need the food movement, we need the farmers movement and there are to unite, to come together and really create a plan, a strategy towards 2030, not 2040, towards 2030, because the next 10 years are decisive in terms of climate change and other things. So resilience beyond um, um, a business as usual, only possible if the movements, the food movements, if, if we get them together and if in the institutions, the people stop silent, uh, silent, silo thinking, sorry, silo thinking and really start integrating the different policies. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Hans, um, for your reflections. Um, and I hope, you know, through the rest of the talks and the discussion, we'll talk a bit more about, you know, concrete strategy, things that can be accomplished in the next, you know, 10 consequential, uh, 10 years, which are very consequential. Um, I'd like to give the floor to Tom uh, Burstyn now. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. And, uh, and many thanks to the Council for European Studies for the invitation today. Um, and greetings to you all on the, on the webinar from the hills of Northern England, uh, the Cheviot Hills, which marks the border with Scotland. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of a discussion about rural responses across Europe. Um, and I must also give extend warm wishes for my colleague Sue Pritchard, who was originally invited to be with you, um, but who finds herself in a very busy lambing shed today. 
which is the reality that quite a few of us live with um, in the UK and I, I guess across the world. Um, I'm not sure where lambing seasons are at the moment, but they're certainly right in the middle of, of uh, our springtime. Um, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK, and put up a few um, slides. So hopefully you will be able to see that uh, on all of your screens. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction into our organisation and then just do a little bit more of a deep dive into some of our work on food systems with some findings on change and thoughts on how to move forward um, from that work. So without further ado, the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, um, it was established as a response to the Brexit vote, funnily enough, and uh, um, to ask serious questions about the implications from that vote for our food and farming systems here in the UK. But we very quickly realised that the real challenges we face are the related emergencies of climate change, of nature breakdown and our public health crisis. Um, so we undertook an 18 month period of inquiry to better understand the shape of a new future for food, farming and countryside in the UK. And to, to your point to the webinar's title today, the rural responses. As well as the normal workshops and calls to evidence and literature reviews, the inquiry included a bike tour to all corners of the UK to uncover voices that are often unheard by policymakers, to reach into the heartlands of our, our rural parts. And so in 2019, we reported in our future in the land, which was very well received across the political and civic society spectrum. We presented the common ground and the common purpose that we had heard amongst the diversity of voices and lived experiences that made up our inquiry. Which leads me on to why we are here as an organization. Um, well, exactly because we see common purpose everywhere. We see that there's mountain agreement that changes must address multiple challenges, the climate and nature emergencies public health, health crisis, and now a fair and green post-COVID economic recovery as well. But we also see a movement beginning to emerge across society ready, ready to take on this challenge. I'm hopeful to, on the challenges that Hans very, articul uh, very eloquently articulated for us. But of course, this isn't just in rural spaces that, that this is going on, because we as an organization work across the whole food system, starting with farmers, we say today to this webinar, yes, Rural UK does offer valuable templates to build more resilient and sustainable societies. But turning this movement and turning ideas and energy into practical and joined up and fair action is now the critical challenge for us. And that's the driving force behind our work as an organization, which focuses on developing a fairer and more just food and farming system. And to echo Hans again, we take a whole system approach. We look to our food and farming systems to deliver against many of our objectives and to deliver again against some of society's greatest challenges. So our 2019 report presented three sets of recommendations, in effect our template for building resilient, prosperous and sustainable societies. Firstly, healthy food is everybody's business. Our food system is not working in the UK. I can say that with some very clear confidence. 25% of our population is obese. And diseases like diabetes, which are linked to unhealthy lifestyles are rife. And no matter which model or outcome you look at, diets in the UK need to become healthier and more sustainable. But achieving dietary change is not easy. And there are particularly strong forces holding back progress in that transformational change that we need. You can read more about that in our report, Our Future in the Land, if you like. Um, but our policy work, our recommendations are around the role for public procurement, for diverse food production, for community food plans. We're doing more research into the dominance of ultra processed foods in our diets and understanding local food systems, which I will talk a little bit more about in detail shortly. We're also doing some framing work for a national food strategy, which is uh, look forward to in the coming months with some great anticipation in this country. Secondly, decades of policy across Europe has been designed to produce ever cheaper food. 
that we know that household food insecurity is rising in the UK. Agriculture and agricultural systems in the UK are going through seismic change. We've just exited the common agriculture policy, which has dominated our farming environment for decades. We have new policy frameworks in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, all being developed independently. We ask our farmers to respond to climate change, food system relationships are becoming more complex. And actually we ask even more demands from our farmers from building houses to responding to climate change and producing food for health. Our policy work in our organization, we find the most plausible and fair future for farming to be found in an agroecological transition to 2030. And we take that same 10 year horizon that Hans has just given us. We think urgent action has to start yesterday. And finally, the UK has a paradoxical relationship with the countryside. On the one hand, our landscapes in the UK define us as nations, but on the other hand, the diversity and complexity of our lives is poorly understood and poorly understood by policymakers, which of course is reflected in policy design. So we work to build a countryside that works for all and to support the rural communities that are a powerhouse for fair and green communities. Our policy work in that is to push for land use frameworks that mitigate the many demands we put on land. We also push for place-based working. And I would love to talk to Hans more about LEADER and the approach that uh, we have seen over, over Europe for the last 30 years, a very successful place-based approach to development. So our work streams support one another to look for those simultaneous transformations in our food environments, in our food system, in our diets, the well-being of our communities and in our farming methods. So I just want to explore for five minutes um, one area of our work a little bit more with you, a bit of a dive into our work on food systems, specifically the role of local food in our, in our search for solutions. This is a summary of some of the work across the last 12 months, particularly in the context of the, the pandemic. Um, so we undertook some UK wide research in June 2020 to see how citizens in the UK were responding and how their behaviours were changing as we were in the middle of our first national lockdown. And it was clear that how people value food in that first national lockdown changed quite dramatically. There was a really significant shift in behaviors. People were cooking more from scratch, from raw, using raw materials much more. They were sourcing food from many different places and more diverse sources. It was also clear that people did not want business as usual once they had changed some of their habits. Once they had seen a different way to behave, it was clear that they did not want to go back. It's interesting to reflect on the results on that desire for big change. We heard a large proportion of people had a great appetite for change. 85% of people want the changes that they've made to continue post lockdown. And of course, you know, this has been a moment of reflection at the start of our pande uh, uh, the, the pandemic 12 months ago. And a lot of people have had the chance the opportunity to ask what is working and what is not working in our systems let's try and bake in some of the positive changes that we are making how people's behaviors were and are changing is is quite clear from our research people are buying directly from producers much more and food is playing a much more central part in people's lives certainly more than perhaps earlier in what are often busy and hectic lives that we all tend to lead now. People were also noticing a, a much stronger sense of community in their local area. They were noticing the need for connection and the value of places in which they live, perhaps partly because of the need to source essentials, the need to find communality in the midst of a lockdown, the need for connection and closeness to the things that matter to us. Some interest in detail on food and exercise. People were cooking a lot more with raw material. I mean, that's a, it's a, that's a big step for us as a country. The one which, you know, we fifty percent of the food that we consume is is classified as ultra processed, which sounds ghastly to me, but uh, that's the reality that we live in. But we were cooking much more with raw materials, and we were throwing away less. These are important considerations when we think about the need for whole system change. For example, less food waste, of course, is a critical factor in reducing carbon emissions in our fight against climate change. 
we followed that first bit of work up with a, a bit more um, targeted research to actually explore the hopes and ambitions and actions from professionals working in the system. There's a couple of points on the screen there for you. On collaboration and diversity, it's interesting to think about the need for diversity. It comes up everywhere in our system. A response to centralization of supply chains and power in the system. Looking at diversity to actually provide more resilience, certainly called into question the level of resilience that a centralized and just-in-time supply chain provides to us now. The second point, investing directly more in communities. Of course, there is a need to nurture local businesses, but there is a massive appetite for more resource into local communities. And there's a shiny data viz to get to, to show those points off, um, which my colleague Elliot has been helping me with on these PowerPoint slides. So don't think he's on the call today, but I must, I must uh, remember Elliot on his houseboat in London to you all who's been helping me today. Um, so... What does that mean? Um, we've wanted to hear more about this aspect of local food, what that actually means in a bit more detail. So we've just concluded a series of workshops in this country exploring what fair, fresh and future-proofed food systems look like. We want to understand the role of local in a bit more detail and how that informs policy recommendations. Interesting to share with you just one of our findings, I suppose. We, we've concluded that local is not a very helpful word because it has so many different meanings. And as a frame, it can trigger conversations about proximity, how close you are to, to somewhere and, and, and geography, and sometimes trade and nationalist trade. I'm thinking about comments that we got in our workshops about, well, we can't, we can't grow bananas in the UK. I, I know all of you, that, that might be a shock to some of you, but you know, our temperatures uh, doesn't allow us to do that. So, you know, part of the response is if you can't grow bananas, you can't have a local food system. We can't call it that because of course we have to bring it from overseas. Well, actually that word local gets in the way of some of the values and the real meanings that people want to express when they talk about local. There's a strong appetite, however, for some of these food systems to have much closer relationships. So conclusions for us are we need to move away from this local and global dichotomy in our discussions. We also need to explore closer relationships between producers and citizens, which Hans talked to us about already. And placemaking is very important to build resilient communities. Finally, uh, just a quick thought about some policy ideas, just to reflect some of the positive ideas that we see. We think it now is a time to be brave. Policymakers are resetting frameworks across the world. There is a need to address very big questions. And I know when we talk about whole system change, that can appear overwhelming, but we see brilliant ideas emerging. A national food strategy long awaited in the UK um, to try and actually complement the mainstream food system with, with more diversity in the system. A beetroot bond, one of our recommendations for every adult in the UK to receive a bond in terms of a monthly dividend to spend on fresh food. Dynamic procurement to bring in small and local producers to public procurement opportunities. Placemaking we've already talked about and to keep our inquiry, our spirit of inquiry open to learn more from elsewhere, including from across the UK, the US rather. We see some of the work that colleagues I'm sure on this call are part of with farmers markets in the US and your supplemental nutritional assistance programs. Is that right? The SNAP? It's it, the SNAP acronym is much better than the long mouthful there, but you know, we see the some of the lessons from that we can be learning as well in, in the UK. Of course, challenges remain. Power and inequality dominate our food systems. Diet change is produce uh, presents huge challenges for us but i'll leave you with a thought from the father of national parks about whole system change and the need for whole system change we can't think of one thing in isolation so we must work alongside one another to find solutions for feeding a growing population with nutritious food for the well-being of our rural communities to meet the challenges we will not find silver bullet answers to reverse the damage caused by the post-war industrialized agriculture that we started with today. To act on climate and nature emergencies requires shared perspectives, broad pathways, balanced inquiry, and collaborative actions from all of us. I'll leave it there, but again, thank you very much for allowing me to join you today. Back to you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your research 
and for your thoughts on you know fair and green uh, food systems and menus so I, i'm looking forward to hearing more about all of this um, for now i'd like to give the floor to uh, madeline mckeever please mute myself um can you hear me yes good okay um i suppose i'm looking at the question i was asked to answer here was does europe rural europe provide valuable templates for building more resilient prosperous and sustainable societies but i'm actually not sure that agriculture has ever been sustainable in ireland you know we started off with hunter gatherers which were joined on the island by Middle Eastern farmers about five and a half thousand years ago. And since then, you know, they've basically been wrecking the environment. And uh, I'm not sure that we have a model of any kind of sustainable agriculture yet. Um, the, um, the COVID epic pandemic actually seems a bit like a trial run for a, um, a climate catastrophe because people did a lot of the things they would do if they actually took climate change seriously, such as not driving around in cars or airplanes, of staying at home and to a large extent increasing the local food that they bought which was very interesting. So I'm not sure that there's any, there's any particular model of agriculture that, that, that we have here that would be um, sustainable, but I think that some of the organic farmers are the closest thing to sustainable. And if I look at it through a lens of, of, a, of a, a, a vegetation historian, I see that up until the 1960s, when I can remember, as far as back as I can remember, the country was full of, of it was mostly covered in grass, and it was absolutely full of insects and birds. And I can remember at, at about the age of 10 or 11 being on the bridge over the Boyne with my father, and he was talking to another man about how all the weed was growing in the river because of the chemical fertilizers and this was a bad thing and it was ruining the salmon fishing. And um, I suppose my father's influences on agriculture would have been mainly his father because he left school at 15 and never did any other agricultural education. And so he would have been influenced by the fact that these cattle farmers in Ireland um, knew that if you plowed up land and grew cereals on it, it would be less fertile afterwards. And they didn't like plowing up land. They thought of it as a really bad thing to do to land. And I can remember them saying how much they had resented during both the First and Second World War. They had had to grow cereals on the farm because uh, there was, it was compulsory for all farmers to, to produce a certain amount of grain to feed people. But I think he, he knew and passed on to me a sense that actually tillage isn't really sustainable in, in the Irish climate. And uh, perhaps, you know, the, the only sustainable form of agriculture we can do is that sort of agroforestry um, with fairly low levels of, of, of animals. And uh, um, anything else is a kind of slash and burn type. You can dig up and you can plow up and grow potatoes somewhere for a couple of years. But if you don't put it back into grass, it'll be gardened out, as they say. And um, so I think that the, the real challenge for, 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 for Ireland as a country um, is how do we actually um, change the whole model of farming? Most farmers who are still in farming adopted this model of produce as much as you can um, at as cheap a level as possible and and buy in as much meal from South America as you can so that we can produce the cheapest beef in the world to feed to the rest of the world. And it's a real challenge to persuade them that this actually isn't really a good idea. Um, the, 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 the pandemic did actually cause some of the food networks. We do have some quite good uh, food networks in place, such as farmers markets, 
Um, in fact, um, in Skibbereen, we have a farmer's market which operates not because the council wanted to, but because they can't stop it. They have endlessly tried to stop us having a farmer's market. But uh, we, we operate on some ancient laws that were put in place by Charles I. So we have ancient market rights there. And, uh, <laughs> and But I mean, they even closed down all the farmer's markets in the pandemic um, because they thought they were more dangerous than the supermarkets. And they did have a kind of a point because when there was nowhere else to go during lockdown, people did go to the farmer's market, stand around in groups, drinking coffee and so on. But it did seem very unfair to shut down the local food systems um, when they left the multiples open. And uh, I think that, you know, we need a whole new mindset before anything major is going to change here. And um, I think that's all I really want to say. Thank you so much uh, for those reflections and, you know, sort of firsthand, almost ethnographic account of what's going on in, in Ireland, you know, generationally from your father to, to now. Um, I will um, now give the floor to um, Elizabeth Jones, who will be moderating discussion. Um, yeah, to sort of move us um, forward in, in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Evie. And um, thank you also uh, to the panelists uh, for your many, um, many ideas about how rural Europe can teach us something um, about how to think about the future in particular. Um, I'm, as um, Evie mentioned in the introduction, I'm a rural historian or was a rural historian until very recently of 19th century <clears throat> Germany. And one of the things that um, struck me as all three of you were speaking is uh, I, I'm a, my center of gravity was the 19th century when the sort of um, silos that many of you spoke about um, between experts and farmers and consumers um, and urban policymakers were being set up and then very fiercely defended. And one of the things that's very exciting to me um, as a as a scholar is to see um, how all of you have talked about um, agriculture um, in as something that concerns all of us and uh, and how I think resilience can be a collective um, endeavor and an urgent endeavor that again, particularly in this case around food systems. Um, so those are um, a couple of brief reflections that I had. And, and I would end with um, the idea for the panel came about when um, I was asked to write um, a piece for Europe Now um, published by CES. And I began um, looking at all of the, the exciting and vibrant um, activities and ideas and movements um, in the European countryside. And again, coming at it from a 19th century um, rural historical perspective, it was extremely exciting for me to see how forward looking and um, how interested all of the actors are that I'm looking at in um, figuring out what fairness means and how to get more people um, involved in, um, in agriculture, again, writ large, and rural, rural societies, and that rural societies matter in a way, and they matter to our future, not as some kind of nostalgic um, uh, post, picture postcard um, image of the way Europe used to be. I think that's, those are all of the, the um, things that were most exciting to me as I delved into this. So that's the inspiration for um, this panel. And um, I'm very excited to open the discussion up for some questions from the audience. Uh, 
we have the first question um, from Canada, and that is um, how this conversation needs to be global and how um, thinking about um, how we share our ideas and how they can be adapted to other communities across the planet um, is one tool to utilize. Um, and I think uh, that would be a question that I would um, put to all three panelists is what you think that um, you are doing, um, how it's relevant perhaps to other, other people addressing the same challenges. Do we want to start with Hannes? Yes, I, I would like to point you at two websites. One is the ARC 2020 EU website, which has a huge um, um, uh, archive of uh, um, the different movements, as well as forum synergies. I would put it on, into the question and answer uh, place where you, where you can find a, a lot of things. I, I, I believe that we have gathered over the past 20, 25 years, um, a very broad network of these local and regional territorial kind of approaches uh, to rural development. Um, 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 uh, and, and of course, um, outstaking is, is, is um, slow food for the food movement, but there are many others. Um, um, there are the farmer, farmers markets, the CSAs and so on. I think they all have in common that they take their destiny into their hands. They don't wait for um, um, any changes in the big uh, framework of policies. They have decided that the change must come from the bottom up. So they are independent from what is being decided uh, in a sense, of course, only, but in, in, in the spirit of we can make it. The problem is, that they are so scattered all over the place that they do not feel that they are part of a movement. So what we are trying to do with ARC and Forum Synergies is to show people they are not alone, they are not marginalized, they are all going in the same direction and, and uh, they can learn from each other. So what, what we have organized over the past 25 years, I can say, is that we have gathered around certain themes and now it's not possible because of COVID, but traveling to a place where people say we have either we have a, a solution to offer for some problem we all have in common, come all in, put your silly questions because we, we are unable to put the silly questions because that's normal for us. We need the people who, who ask the silly questions that we can learn and then to draw from their solutions to that problem or to uh, share the, the, the possibilities of adapting it in other places. So I think, yes, all over the world, we have the same problem that farming has go, gone crazy in industrializing. We have the same problem that people are alienated, don't have, uh, are not in connection over the food, um, have been separated in many ways. The silos are in the way of finding solutions. So we all have the same problems all over the world. And we have specific solutions, which might look completely different in, in, according to the different conditions, but they have one thing in common, that no solution is uh, expected from the top down anymore. On the other, uh, on the contrary, it's something is growing from the bottom up. The only uh, difficulty is to reconnect these people across Europe, across countries, territories, and on the global level. And I think this is the main, main challenge now that people are trying, that the energy is there for change, to move towards more resilient food systems, but they do not feel that they are part of that movement and they do not connect sufficiently uh, to, to, to have that critical mass for the big change, for the paradigm change everybody is talking about, but which is already happening. Sorry, I was a bit long. Um, I, I might just 
pop in, if, if I may, Elizabeth, yeah, and, and thanks very much, Peter, for your question from Canada. Um, I suppose there's a couple of points that, that I'd make. I think there's there's clearly an opportunity to share learning around the world, both in terms of you know, some of the methods of organising that, that Hans has talked about. And, and it's quite clear that some of the very best of development approaches that you now see on, on uh, around Europe take in part their inspiration for methods that were developed in the, in the global south and in the developing world in the overseas development sector around those principles of place-based approaches and taking uh, integrated views of community needs and so on, so on. So, you know, that that's absolutely, a, a, um, it just sort of brings into sort of perspective a little bit the, the, the question you're asking, Peter, or the point you're making. You know, we think about some of the issues that we're trying to conf confront as globally significant. If we, as a, in, in the UK, if, if the UK society chooses to offshore its food production and to rewild the UK, which of course is one of the arguments that um, citizens and businesses put forward, then that doesn't really tackle the systemic changes or issues that we face. It doesn't tackle the issues of diet change and the need for changing our farming methods. So we think about how we do that together. We think about whose interests are, uh, um, are held by business as usual and what role the huge amounts of investment that we're going to see around the world on post-COVID recovery take in driving some of these agendas. And what tools our government have, because you know we, we see a lot of our citizens in the UK talk about government responsibility when it comes to, to this big systemic action. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm pleased to say that UK government does show some leadership in this sense sometimes. Um, we've got some very interesting dialogues around uh, forestry and agriculture commodity trade. And um, we're taking the opportunity of hosting, co-hosting the COP26 conference later this year to push some of that global action. And there's a real opportunity in what other people are calling a super year of global action. So let's hold our nerve and, and keep calling for those shared actions, Peter. Thank you. Um, I would uh, ask Madeline too to, um, one of the things that I was interested in hearing about, and this connects both the question at hand, um, but also um, the next question about the meanings of local. Um, I would be very curious to hear from Madeline about um, who you're, to whom you're selling your seeds and the conversations around um, resilience and adaptability that you are having with the people who purchase your seeds. In other words, are your buyers, um, how far afield um, are the buyers? And are they rural primarily? Are they urban? Um, and that may be a way of talking about um, the, there was a, uh, a question both about the blurring of rural and urban boundaries um, that is, I think, productive that we've been talking about um, and also um, about how we think about the local and its meaning um, as well as its value, um, whether it's um, based on something you're trying to grow in a specific place um, or um, a way of building um, and strengthening communities. So um, I'd be interested in hearing more about brown envelope seeds and in relation to those questions. Well, I've had orders this week from New Zealand, Australia, Czech Republic, France, the UK. Um, I get them from everywhere, but the bulk of them are from Ireland and the bulk are from Cork, you know, because I'm, I'm much better known locally than, say, up in Dublin. People wouldn't know about me that much. Um, so they're mostly small growers. I only sell in small packets, so I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I think people usually find me because I have some unusual varieties that nobody else is selling and then they go oh well I might as well get them all here you know it's it's, it's small growers this year during the during January February when they when a lot of the commercial organic growers realized they couldn't get seed in from the UK because of Brexit they started getting a bit panicky and asking me what I had but I didn't really suit them because I don't have the quantities that they would need um, but there is a lot of interest. I do like little small packets of cereals and there's a big 
you know, interest in them this year, have heritage cereals and so on. Um, so I think that that is one of the things that is happening in West Cork is that there are little micro farms happening. Um, unfortunately, they're happening on the very worst quality land because that's the only thing people can afford to buy who don't come from, you know, a beef baron kind of family or a dairy baron family. And uh, so, but there are small horticultural operations building, there are community gardens building. There's quite a lot of alternative, small, very small alternative um, networks building. Does that answer? I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> uh, it was um, it was about I think um, asking about conversations across um, boundaries and um, how your experiences um, and uh, and the conversations that you've been having over the last year are applicable perhaps to um, other parts of the world um, and so I mean. For example, do do the customers that you have from very far uh, away um, are they? Do they then report um, back to you about the success of of a particular crop? Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they'll just buy it again, which is it, which is just as good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I th but they are they are mostly people far away are mostly interested in things that you can't get anywhere else and I think like a window of opportunity is is closing at the moment you know we have access at the moment to genetic resources all over the world through seed companies and but gradually they're closing like this year um I've noticed some UK UK companies won't well people from the mainland Britain won't send seed to, seeds to us and um and American companies are starting not wanting to send to Europe. I don't know why. Some did. Some I did get some from Lake Creek this year, but other companies have said no, no, we don't want to send it outside of the US. And it may be just that they don't have the, you know, they just aren't used to doing it and they don't want to do it. Um, but it it seems that for the last few years there was a major opportunity because we had the internet. You can, you know, just search any variety that you want and, and find it anywhere in the world. And um, and so any, everything was available and now that those windows are closing. Thank you. Um, I'd uh, move on to a couple of the other questions um, that we have. Um, again, one of them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Hannes, do you wanna jump in? Just, just for a second on sure. seed, I just chat with you on this question and answer, uh, a website that is called Seeds for All. Um, since, uh, um, well, from next year, European legislation on seed marketing, at least for organic seeds, has uh, strongly changed. It, you know, the seed laws, seed marketing laws in Europe are very restrictive. You can only have varieties which are in the catalog and the catalog is, you know, the, uh, the place where the big companies uh, put their seeds and uh, they have go, to go through trials and it costs a lot of money. So if you want to have access to farmer's seeds, traditional seeds, Harlem seeds or whatever, you now can market and buy them legally <laughs> Uh, um, uh, in the in the in the context of organic farming, which which is a revolution, um, and the problem is that now, it, as it is legal, the big companies start investing there again to get their hand on it. So to avoid that, exactly this open market is establishing. So what what we are trying to do with this seeds for all movement, it's really a seed movement is to get the seed savers, the farmers, the um, uh, reproducers, the um, uh, seed uh, selling companies, the smaller ones onto the market to make sure that uh, or varieties fit for organic farming and fit for resilient production really are accessible. Because you should know, even organic farmers in Europe, also in the UK, use conventional seeds just one year reproduced without chemicals. They are made for industrial farming, not for resilient farming. So they are weak. 
So it, the, really the material, as, as Madeleine said, you know, is, is, is so little quantities when, when there is a demand for it, so little quantities on the market that organic farmers usually switch onto the conventional uh, varieties uh, because they are simply not available. I think it's, it's, it's a big chance and it's a big movement into making those uh, traditional farmer seeds or fit for um, organic farming specifically to get them, them onto the market. So have a look at that website. You see all the details there. And Madeleine, I would really like to have an exchange with you because I'm into uh, organic uh, seeds uh, on our farm, in, on our island with, the, with, with young farmers. Uh, I've just uh, uh, reproduced a, a variety from Sweden uh, um, um, of rye. Um, I, I will send you uh, uh, some seeds if you are interested, so for, for reproduction. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tom, did you want to um, respond to any of that? And also, I think um, my question was about the, if you could reflect a little bit more, um, and this is also based on an audience question about um, the usefulness of the term local and uh, the resurgence of interest in the term, I think during the pandemic and whether, if it is valuable as a term, then in, in what sense? Um, and if it isn't, if it's become just a slogan, um, if you could kind of talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you very much for the questions and, and for Madeline and, and Hans' thoughts there as well. It's a really fascinating topic. I think just picking up on one word which you raised there, Elizabeth, um, the slogan issue. I mean, our, our research has shown that people in the UK have tried to change their shopping habits as part as a as a response to to the to the national lockdown. Now, of course, in part, that was about the availability of supermarkets, whether they were open or not, and whether you were allowed to actually travel to them. But in part, it was also about that reflective opportunity about what do we now need? You know, how and, and how do you actually respond when your normal habits cannot cannot sort of be facilitated, if you like? You know, how do you actually survive? How do you how do you access the, the essentials? So there were some really um significant questions, which of course are felt much more keenly in, in uh, around the world. There were some significant questions that UK citizens had to face around accessing healthy and affordable food during lockdown which of course we we take for granted in some in some parts of our society so there was a a move to a much closer relationship between consumers and producers as part of that solution and there was a move to more local in terms of the sort of the closeness that the, your your village shop or your nearby neighborhood shop that that was able to find resources now Speaking to your point about sloganeering, our supermarkets were very, very quick, of course, to respond to this challenge as well. And, and there was a big marketing campaign about Sainsbury's has kept um, the nation fed, you know, and Asda has provided this food for you in this moment of crisis. And of course, our farmers and our producers who are not as organized and find it difficult to lever the same sort of marketing power are unable to actually respond to that sort of so the narrative is really important here as well you know about who controls the narrative about who is actually feeding people in your country and and yet despite that uh, use of that slogan there has been a real sort of plurality of um, shopping habits emerge that that were not part of our normal habits and yes, we can. You know, we wanted to dig into this a little bit more as an organization. So we wanted to explore the use of the term local and what it actually means now and how embedded and what sort of support this will require uh, in the future, if that is something that's of value. What we found was that actually the term local now means so much that you have to be able to cut through it. I, I, I think in, in answer to the question, 
you know, it means an awful lot of positive things to an awful lot of people. But because it is has got such a broad meaning now, and because it's actually been, there was the other one, the other one of the other supermarkets was calling themselves the local. Suddenly, you know, that became part of their slogan. It was a direct use of that term. So, because it was almost being co-opted, you know, we used to, we have. I think everybody will understand on the call the phrase greenwashing. You know, how you actually show yourself to be nature friendly because it it suits. The message you're trying to give well we had this local washing going on that people were using the term organizations businesses were using the term to mean all sorts of things and then of course that is then easy to dismiss if you're a policymaker because you can say well it means this so we're going to ignore that or well, you can't grow bananas in the uk so you can't you know what's the point of even thinking about local food systems you have to have a global food system in the uk you know, we don't dispute that. What we want to get at is what are the additional benefits that local systems and local solutions can can uh, can offer? What is the uh, what are the values and the and the um, contribution that they can make to actually make our system more resilient? You know, it, it's a it was a a wonderful finding for your for your webinar title. You know, this is a real sort of real life sort of example of trying to or recognizing that a system was less resilient than we actually assumed it was and thinking about the sorts of things that we can add to make it more resilient so you know at the ffcc we talk about whole system approaches and we want to hold a broad path for lots of different perspectives to come together and so we don't say this is the, the very narrow way that we all have to move forward so we talk about local food systems emerging to complement what we have already and add resilience to it. And of course, with the plurality of places and the approach to place making, the solutions are many and, manif and, and you know, manifold. The, the, the blurring of lines between urban and rural, of course, absolutely, that just adds further diversity to the solutions that we seek. Um, so, you know, we want to talk more about the values that people were expressing around connection and shortening some of those supply chains rediscovering almost the knowledge that Madeline and Hans have just talked about that is so important to vibrant and sustainable agriculture in the future. Questions of fairness about how people do actually access uh, um, healthy and affordable food. There's some fascinating research just been published called Rural Lives in, in the UK, which um, a number of universities have collaborated on. And they have found in the in the 20 years from 1990 to 2010, 50% of rural residents actually fell into poverty. And even now in 2018, half of rural residents in the UK exhibit financial vulnerability. So the question of access in affordable and healthy food is right here, right now in our rural communities. And of course, in our urban communities as well, the percentages are the same in the UK across rural and urban, but of course, Rural offers some different solutions. Some of the values are the same, you know, and we look for this, we look for greater diversity. So we want to explore some of those values that local holds rather than a simple, because I find it, it it's too easy to dismiss it if we keep it simple. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I, one of the things that uh, struck me too, as you were speaking is that uh, at least in the United States, um, the it's sometimes local from some perspectives have has been um, too much associated with something that's elite that is that you know only only people who are better off can afford to purchase uh, local food because it's more expensive and and though I think there are at least again particularly in the United States and I imagine in Europe too that there is a tension there um between um who can access this and uh, how easily um and in madeline then referred to also the the question of access to uh decent land or decent soil um i think those are all um uh important issues that i think are at least um i feel optimistic that they're at least being these issues are being raised um, now and again, particularly in light of the conversation earlier about looking towards 2030, 
Um, I think how to improve access is, is um, really essential um, to um, making this a more equitable, um, just not only a more equitable discussion, but more equitable in terms of, uh, and healthy in terms of uh, food access. Um, Evie, do you have any um, questions that are popping up in your, that I'm not able to see? Um, no, we have access to the same, um, the same questions here. Um, if you, we can jump around a little bit. I don't know if you want to start from even the bottom and work our way up. Um, I will try to do okay. that. Um, uh, there's a question about, um, agricultural societies and communities account today for only a fraction of the population um, in developed economies and are outnumbered by urban societies. Um, and the trend towards urban life is clear. How, how can their voices not be drowned out by all the other concerns of urban driven life? Um, and I, I think to some degree you've answered those questions, um, but um, maybe again, uh, I can ask you to reflect on how the work that you're doing um, blurs, blurs those um, old dichotomies between um, urban and, and rural. Hans, yeah. Yes, I, I think, well, to, to refer to Europe, the access to land movement is a is reflecting a clear trend of young people um, uh, in Europe not being daughter or son of a farmer and inheriting uh, that they want to get support as startup in the rural areas, especially now in COVID times that has increased enormously because with the digital possibilities, people can combine farming with other jobs. So part-time farming is not a way out of farming into the urban area for many young people, especially, uh, I see it now in the Baltic countries, a very strong movement in the Baltic countries to revitalize the countryside and start up rural life with farming and many other things because you can live in the countryside and still do a job with uh, with the digital means that are there and th those countries are really far ahead of many other big countries in Europe with the digital life they they have perfect systems which which are light um, um, uh, full full access to uh, everything they need and the the, the question of whether they get uh, access to land is secondary. It's the life in the countryside that counts. It's the possibility of being connected. And they, they are very Latvian rural movement is just, I can, I can provide you the, the access to that network. It's a lot of young people with, with the ambition of living in the countryside. Um, and that's, that's really encouraging. The other, the other aspect of it is, you know, the real access to land thing is, the problem is, it's so enormously costly if you want to be a real farmer to get into farming without having a heritage, because you have to invest millions to be a competitive farmer. So it's only a collective system that can work with support uh, of the government with support of consumers who say, we pay you uh, at the beginning of a season and you have the right, that's CSA, you have the right to your food during the year. So it's an it's a upfront trust saying, we believe that you will make it, we want your food, we want to support you, we want you to live in the countryside. So um, it, it's interesting, you know, there was an initiative in, in uh, the last cap reform 
uh, where the newcomers, the new entrants, they were called, were mentioned as possible recipients of public money. And the farmers organization went strongly against it because they didn't want competition on the land they wanted to control. Usually they take over the land from the uh, um, uh, old farmers moving out and they don't want newcomers to come in. So it needs uh, also on, on the legislative level, it, it needs changes because otherwise there's no way uh, for newcomers uh, to get into farming. So um, I, I think that's an interesting point, you know, um, uh, um, uh, revitalization of rural areas, I think go first uh, with young people who, who do startups in the countryside, not necessarily depending on access to land of, of farming, but they can do anything, any service that can be linking uh, urban and rural uh, be it leisure, be it uh, nature, um, 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 ex experience, uh, be it, you know, any, any other thing. But again, it only works if it all comes together. You know, it, you cannot live just on small scale farming or just on, uh, it, it needs a combination of, of, of different uh, uh, activities and income. Um, Elizabeth, we have about seven minutes left. Um, maybe we can ask for some concluding remarks and I'll just take the last minute to um, wrap up the, the session, unless there's a, a particular question you'd like to, um, like to raise first. Uh, thank you, Evie. I, um, for me, again, I think the question um, about the future and how to move forward um, is, is really an essential one. And I think um, all of you have given us um, your reflections about, about that. But I think um, I was, again, struck by um, the need to uh, talk about how action that action needs to be taken um, quickly um, and immediately rather than waiting for 2040. And perhaps um, maybe each of you could talk about what you think could be, um, could actions that could be taken perhaps by rural communities, not just um, where you live, um, but perhaps uh, drawing lessons from um, the actions that you see that are possible and doable and how they might um, spark ideas about action elsewhere. Maybe if you, could, if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the most, um, the area where you think change could happen most quickly and uh, forcefully and make, really make a difference. Um, I think that we need strong legislation as soon as possible that requires farmers to use chemicals to buy a license. At present, if you want to be an organic farmer, you have to buy a license and it's quite expensive and jumps through a lot of bureaucratic hoops to be certified as organic. And really the onus should be on um, farmers to use chemicals to buy licenses to use them because I think that would reduce a lot the, um, the destruction being caused by um, uh, chemical use in agriculture in Ireland and would level the playing field and make organic farming more attractive. I also think we need to phase out the, the private car um, because you know, if we want to become carbon neutral quite quickly, we've got to stop driving around endlessly, especially in the countryside. It's the rural users of cars that are actually um, have a much higher footprint than urban ones. May I ask um, um, those of us helping in the back end if we will have a hard cut off um, at the half hour mark, just so we don't cut someone off in the middle of a response? I'll wait for that response, um, but just a heads up, we have about four minutes. Thank you. We are I'll, good to continue conversation. I'll have, a, I'll have a 
quick go at answering that. Um, I, I was thinking about the question that you'd asked just before as well, and I, I might try and answer the question in, in part by, by reflecting on that as well. I think, um, yes, absolutely, inequality exists in rural areas as well. Um, and that is is very clear in, in the sort of the nature of that inequality in terms of employment opportunities that exist for people who live in, in, in rural areas in resources and access to resource and support that they can access, whether they are elderly or young or trying to start up a business. But there is untapped potential in rural areas. And I would echo comments that a few of you have made on that. Um, I think for us to, you know, there are very powerful narratives that emerge when you start digging into research in rural areas around, around this inequality, around rich and poor, around long-term residents and incomers, uh, new ideas and change to systems that have been there for a long time. We have to listen and pay attention to lived experiences. If you're working in rural development or urban development, they're very powerful. Um, approaches to contributing to some of the solutions that we need. So in answer to the specific question that was asked in the Q&A, I hope that the rural voice is not drowned out because the challenges that we face rely on rural solutions as well as urban solutions. We look to our land to uh, contribute to climate change, to produce a healthy diet, um, to give us health and welfare, um, contributions to build our houses on. The whole question of affordable food has to be reframed so that healthy food is affordable, so that we're not allowed to slip into simple polarised views that vegetable boxes are more expensive and are part of that elite system. And, and it is, it is uh, I, you know, I would argue we can't wait for the market to do that. We'll have to see government action in actually reframing that affordable food system and looking at that as a whole system approach. Uh, and, and finally, while I was just on before this webinar looking at electric cars, Madeline, um, I think the one the one sort of approach I would leave people with is a transition to agroecological farming as soon as possible, which will again require government legislation for us to do that. I think that's the single biggest move that we can that we can make. Is one minute left or a little more? It sounds like we have enough time to hear your response. Okay, okay, okay. Minute, please. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I, uh, what Madeleine said, you know, there's a very nice um, uh, piece of theater of Berthold Brecht, which is the rule and the exemption. We have to turn it around that the rule is clearly not only through legislation, but in the spirit of people. The rule is resilient farming systems, then the exception is conventional farming to be to be phased out. And that makes a completely different picture. That for people that makes a completely different picture. It is not the organic that needs subsidies. It is the uh, responsibility of the conventional farmer to say I'm polluting because, and, and then has to pay for it. That's a completely different story. And that makes organic produce uh, quality the rule. So I think that's, that's a good picture to say, we need to reverse rule and exception in the farming and the food system. People usually quickly understand what that means politically. Um, I, I, I believe uh, to, I think I'm a, an optimist by nature, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to work 35 years in the European institutions. I believe that the energy that is in rural areas and between people is there. What matters is the connection. The connection is possible if the different movements get into conversation about the different roles in doing the things that need to be done. And I can tell you, Fridays for Future haven't been interested in agriculture at all so far because it seemed also complicated because of the cap and the subsidies and nobody really wanted to get into it. They are now fully into it because they say we need a change in the agricultural system. Otherwise, we will not be able to, to cope with 2030. So those are now our 
key partners in ARC, young people, mainly women, very active, um, speaking out clearly, uh, of course, from uh, urban areas mainly, but we have to look for the partners that are driving the whole thing. And there are lots of things winnable, not that we should believe that um, the EU or even the new UK government will make the big difference, right? We can look at each other and see where the good things are coming out, but uh, we have to rely on the people that are in the movements and connect them. And that's mainly what we are doing at ARC. Uh, Agriculture and Rural Convention is quite a big network, and we are working with lots of partners uh, around Europe and, and also in the United States. So I believe we have a job to do. Uh, and thank you very much for this seminar. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure. And I think between the panelists, we should at least uh, exchange all the good sources. So we, re we connect in a way that from this seminar, uh, we can connect more people. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, for your questions to so everyone who attended for your questions um, in the back end with Sudan and then also Julia and everyone who helped organize um, this session um, at Council for European Studies. Um, so um, this session, um, the recording will be posted to the CES YouTube channel. Um, also that's where all of the um, insights webinars are uploaded in case you want to take a look at um, other sessions of the series. Um, and a link will be provided to everyone who has registered um, so I also hope that we can find ways to continue these conversations. And thank you again for having me be a part of this fantastic session. Okay.